Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Alrighty, welcome back to Dark Poutine. Matthew forgot his computer. So he has to use mine. <laughs> I have yours. And there, um, a reminder has just come up in your calendar. Yeah. That says dark poutine episode tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. <laughs> anyway, I am Mike Brown, and this is Matthew Stockton. And we're doing a bit of a, a different thing this week. We're going to update some cases that uh, are very interesting, but we covered them a long time ago. But I'll get into that in a sec. First, let's uh, do the thing. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Patin podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In this episode, we're providing updates on two historical shows now recently solved by way of DNA technology and genetic genealogy. In the first half of this episode, we have recent updates to show 130, where we learned of the brutal rape and murder of Montreal teen Sharon Pryor. We can finally answer the question posed in that episode's title, Who Killed Sharon Pryor? In the second half, we go all the way back to episode 13, Babes in the Woods, Stanley Park. In that show, we learn that in 1953 in Vancouver Stanley Park, the skeletal remains of two young boys were found. They had been murdered around 1947 with a hatchet that was found nearby their bones. The boys' identities remained a mystery until 2022 when their names were finally restored. You're listening to Dark Poutine Episode 271, Case Updates, Sharon Pryor and the Babes in the Woods. Sharon Pryor, a vibrant 16-year-old secondary school student, mysteriously vanished on Saturday the 29th of March 1975 from Point St. Charles, a neighborhood in Montreal where she resided with her family. After bidding her mother farewell, she set off on foot to rendezvous with her friends at a local pizzeria situated just five blocks away, and that was the last occasion that Sharon was seen alive. Three days following her disappearance on April 1st, Sharon's severely battered remains were discovered in a field in Longueuil, a different suburb of Montreal situated across the St. Lawrence River from her home. She had been sexually assaulted and murdered. Sharon's family and law enforcement tirelessly pursued her assailant for nearly half a century. In a recent development, very recent, the identity of Sharon's murderer has finally been unveiled. Before we get into recent updates, let's refresh our memories of Sharon's family her life, and the crime itself. Yvonne, Sharon's mother, was originally from England but migrated to Montreal as a young girl. The family settled in Point St. Charles, known to the locals simply as The Point. This area is one of the city's oldest neighborhoods. Here, Yvonne encountered George Pryor, who was serving as a private in the Canadian Armed Forces. Their shared affection blossomed into love, leading to marriage. 
They were filled with joy when their first child, Sharon Kim Pryor, arrived in the world on February 9, 1959. Sharon's family was blessed with identical twin sisters a day before she turned two. Sharon regarded Maureen and Doreen, in her cheerful innocence, as her personal birthday gift. As is customary with military families, George Pryor was reassigned, taking him to Manitoba, which meant leaving behind Yvonne's cherished neighborhood of Point St. Charles. Their youngest child, George Jr., was born in Manitoba, affectionately known as Jojo by his family. He completed the Pryor clan. My BFF actually lives um, a f- literally a few blocks from where this happened. Wow. In, in the Point. Yeah. So I was talking to her this morning about it. Mm-hmm. I thought, um, hey, let's get a little bit of background. Sure. It was predominantly an Irish working class neighborhood. Okay. Yep. A lot of poverty. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, so it was, it was mostly an Anglophone neighborhood back then. And Meredith is saying that uh, it started getting gentrified in the 90s, like the hipsters started coming in. Sure. And she said it's nicer now, but it's not the best looking neighborhood. It's tiny little row houses. Okay. Right? And we think... I she, think those row houses aren't that bad. You know, I kind of like them in a way. They have a, a certain... Yeah, yeah. They, they hearken to a certain era. Yeah, there's just not a lot of... Uh, trees in front of them. Oh, like okay. I've been in this neighborhood a lot, sure. right? And we think maybe Yvonne liked liked it because it sort of has a bit of a European feel to it. Oh, maybe. Maybe that's what reminded her of it. And uh, so now, you know, you can you can get nine dollar ice cream cones, um, but at the same time, <laughs> there's still old families and there's still some poverty. So it's one of those mixed neighborhoods, right? Oh, now. gentrification. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was strife in the relationship between George Senior and Yvonne, and it became untenable. And in 1966, they decided to part ways. Yvonne, with her four young children, made the decision to return to the point. Although the split was difficult, the prior kids kept their heads up. In all accounts, Sharon is depicted as a gentle, kind-hearted, and giving individual. Photographs shared on the family-maintained website, SharonPrior.com, back this up, presenting Sharon as a delightful blonde-haired girl possessing a reserved grin and a warm, inviting countenance. According to true crime blogger Michelle McNamara, author of the unrelated book I'll Be Gone in the Dark, Sharon was a tender-hearted soul, according to Yvonne, embodying the responsibility and care often associated with a little old lady. Mm. Sharon, a passionate animal lover, would take in abandoned animals, nursing them tenderly. She dreamt of one day becoming a veterinarian. Once the family discovered some turtles while on a trip to the country, and in her passionate spirit, Sharon decided they deserved a suitable environment to flourish. The memory of Sharon in the backyard amidst turtles carefully crafting a special home for them is still vivid in Yvonne's mind. Yvonne said wistfully, quote, Oh, how I wish we were talking about chocolate turtles instead. <laughs> That's a really sweet story, but I'm kind yeah. of like, well, maybe the turtles in their natural environment would have been fine. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> hey, they need a better home. They are where they are naturally born. <laughs> yeah, they're doing, they're doing just fine. Those chocolate turtles yeah. always remind me of my mom because for some reason, when I was a little kid, mm-hmm. I think she liked I thought she liked them. Uh, and from about seven, any sort of Mother's Day or Christmas or her birthday, bought her turtles, always a box of turtles. And she hated them. I don't know. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna ask her. I, like I, maybe she's just being nice every time I gave them to her. Maybe. <laughs> One of the photos often shared of Sharon Pryor shows her at 13 years old in a cap and gown, as though she were graduating from high school. During that period, Yvonne managed a second-hand clothing store, generously providing clothes to needy people. Sharon came across an outfit in the donation bin, put it on, and played out a mock graduation while Yvonne captured the moment in photographs outside their home. Unbeknownst to Yvonne at that instant, she was never to witness this scene play out in reality at Sharon's actual graduation ceremony. And we talk about that often, sort Mm -hmm. of all all the missed opportunities uh, in life when somebody's taken away like this. Right. But uh, I was looking at photographs of of her uh, online. Mm -hmm. She was gorgeous. Yeah, she's very pretty. Like, you kind of get, like, 1970s movie star she could have been. Yeah. Yeah, she was beautiful. Yeah. Sharon was deeply engaged with the Boys and Girls Club via the YMCA as she transitioned into her teenage years. 
One widely shared picture shows her radiating with joy sitting at a kitchen table with her hand confidently placed on the trophy she had recently won from a floor hockey tournament. Sharon's family still displays the photo of Sharon and her prize, and they've also hung on to the trophy itself. Sharon was popular among the other teens in the point. Her buddies always said she was the best-looking one in the group. Her best pals said that her looks and popularity hadn't gone to her head and that she was always sweet and kind, if even a bit timid. Looking back, they said the point seemed like the best place to be a kid, with everyone as tight as family. They had each other's backs. They always felt safe there until the awful day that Sharon's body was found. Nothing bad had ever happened before then. A terrible crime, like a murder, can flip a town upside down. It wasn't the same, and no one knew who to trust anymore. Michelle McNamara shared a small snippet from Sharon's diary penned shortly after her 16th birthday bash, barely a month before her disappearance. In this entry, Sharon talks about her boyfriend John, who she had been fond of since grade four. It offers a real peek into what was up with Sharon then and the sort of girl she was. Here's what she wrote. Quote, they played and sang Sweet Sixteen and put mine and John's name into it. I was so embarrassed, and John was really embarrassed. I think my mother's so good to me, end quote. That fateful Saturday morning, March 29, 1975, Sharon arose, had breakfast, cleaned up, dressed, and tidied her bed just like any other day. Meanwhile, Yvonne set out for shopping, collecting additional items required for the Easter feast. She also brought home chocolate eggs and other treats for the kids, Sharon, Maureen, Jojo, and recently added four-year-old foster son, Stephen. When Yvonne came home, she sat at the kitchen table and watched Sharon lovingly paint Easter eggs. After decorating half of the Easter eggs, Sharon set out to collect her Leo's Boys jacket from the Boys and Girls Club. Leo's Boys Sports Association was an initiative by Joe Mel in memory of his brother Leo, who succumbed to leukemia at the age of 17. As per the Montreal Gazette, there was a period in the point when it was nearly impossible not to encounter a kid adorned in a green jacket bearing the Leo's Boys emblem. Originating in 1952, with two teams and 30 children, Leo's Boys saw its zenith, with 110 teams and nearly 1,000 children engaged in various sports like hockey, baseball, football, and boxing. Each of these children received a green Leo's Boys jacket, which didn't cost their families a dime. Funds for Leo's Boys were generated through community donations and fundraisers, with the children obliged to sell raffle tickets. Sharon, a regular at the club since the age of six, and now a center on her floor hockey team, was keen on earning one of those jackets, and she had sold enough raffle tickets to secure one. She asked her mother Yvonne if she could take her four-year-old little foster brother Stephen along. Once Yvonne gave her the green light, they embarked on their journey with foster brother in tow. However, when they arrived at the club, they were informed that her jacket size wasn't available. They reassured her that it wouldn't be long before she could collect her jacket and provided her with a receipt for future pickup. True to her considerate nature, Sharon thought of ordering a smaller jacket for Stephen, who didn't have a fitting spring coat. Always selfless, she also took it upon herself to drop off her friend's jacket on the way home. She spent the rest of the afternoon painting the rest of the Easter eggs and entertaining the family's reverend who came for a brief visit. After dinner, between 6 and 7, Sharon's longtime friend visited her. They lived on the same block and had known each other since the age of 5. Sharon told her friend she was preparing to head to Marina's Pizza with some other friends. Sharon couldn't decide what to wear but eventually settled on wearing one of her mom's tops. Marina's Pizza, a favorite hangout spot for many of Sharon's friends, was situated at the intersection of Wellington and Ash Avenue. This venue was a regular meeting place where they would enjoy soft drinks and converse about anything from boys to the latest music trends. Despite being only five blocks, 650 meters away from Sharon's home, a seven-minute walk, Sharon hesitated to wear her brown suede jacket due to the rain, but her mother assured her that the drizzle wouldn't harm it. At around 7.10 p.m., Sharon headed out the door, calling out, Goodbye, Mom, to which her mother responded with her usual, Goodbye, Sharon, be careful. Her friend, already waiting downstairs on the sidewalk, offered to accompany Sharon to Barina's. However, Sharon graciously declined the offer, crossed the street, and continued her journey alone. 
Sharon Pryor never made it to the pizza shop. You know, the one thing I noticed about this is it, what strikes me is when somebody goes missing, mm -hmm. it's always so, nobody ever gradually goes missing. Yeah. Right? It's just life, daily life's happening and then suddenly gone. Yeah. Right? There's no gradual buildup to any of this. No. Uh, and the, the shock it must be to, to the, the, the family, the community. Yeah. It's huge. It, yeah, it's hard. To, it's like hard to wrap your brain around when something happens that quickly. Yeah. If, and, like ever. And you must be thinking as well, hey, if she stayed and talked to me for five more minutes with the person who did it, like had turned yep. the corner and not seen her or something like this, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, uh, some friends I know usually refer to that as seconds and inches. We yeah. don't know how close we've come. To seconds and centimeters. Seconds and centimeters in <laughs> Canada, yeah. When Sharon didn't arrive at the pizza place, her female friends assumed that she had just gone to the Montreal Forum to watch the Canadians game with her boyfriend John and some other boys. But when the boys arrived at Marina's Pizzeria after the game, Sharon wasn't with them. They hadn't seen her all evening. A friend called Sharon's home, asking after her at around 9 p.m., but Yvonne said Sharon had gone out around 7 the friend related that there was an attack on another woman named Cheryl Roy on Ash Avenue around the time Sharon would have been walking in the neighborhood. The man had put a knife to Miss Roy's throat and demanded she follow him. She fought. Another group walking in the neighborhood had scared off the attacker, and the perpetrator had fled in the direction Sharon would have been walking. Cheryl Roy was later able to describe the man. He was white, he spoke English, he was tall, around 6 feet 2 inches, with light brown hair, blue eyes, and about 200 pounds with a mustache. He was wearing blue jeans and a royal blue ski jacket, and was presumed to be in his mid to late 20s. After that phone call, Yvonne, of course, began to worry. She instinctively knew that something was wrong and began calling around, eventually involving the police at around 2 a.m., the family was worried for the next three days, and especially when a semi-nude body was found on April 1st in a wooded area in Longay. Her mom found out about the body's discovery through a neighbor's newspaper and immediately knew it was her Sharon. Sharon's twin sisters later recalled Yvonne's screams on seeing the photo in the paper which showed a body lying in the snow. The family's worst fears were confirmed. Sharon had been bound with her coat, brutally beaten, raped, murdered and left in the snow. She'd choked to death on her own blood due to the beating her killer had inflicted. Her pants had been removed and lay nearby. Her shoes were still on her feet. Police and Sharon's family believed that the earlier attack might have been related, but they were unable to identify that perpetrator at that time. The point had lost its innocence, but Sharon's family never gave up hope that her murder would one day be solved. Although there had been numerous leads and suspects in the intervening years, solving Sharon's murder was always a priority for the Longay police. In December of 2021, Detective Sergeant Eric Rassico, the 14th lead detective on the case, came to believe that recent updates in DNA investigation technology could finally solve the murder. Rassico was working on another cold case and became interested in Sharon's case, thinking it might be related. Rassico dove into eight boxes worth of witness interviews and reports, meticulously looking for clues that earlier investigators might have missed. Rassico made sure to keep the Pryor family informed of every new development. They'd been doing their own investigating over the years and had suspected several people, most local to Montreal. Nothing panned out. They themselves had contacted investigators before Rasco came onto the case about a recently solved case in Toronto, that of Christine Jessup, that had been solved using genetic genealogy. They were excited by the possibility of resolving Sharon's case using the same technology. DNA had been extracted and given to Parabon for genetic phenotyping, but no suspects had been identified. Rasico discovered that items related to Sharon's murder particularly the clothing she'd been found with, had been well-preserved. Looking at crime scene photos, it struck Rassico that Sharon's shoes were still on her feet, even though her pants had been removed. This would have required significant effort on the part of her attacker and hopefully might have left his DNA on her pants. Rassico was correct. 
DNA samples were extracted from Sharon's pants, a shirt, and panties, and another profile was created. Yeah, that's so smart. It, it seems so obvious. But mm -hmm. to sit there and like look at the photos and go, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, that would have been difficult. So therefore, I might be able to get some DNA. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting thinking. Like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Right. But I guess that's what he's paid for. I yeah. guess so. <laughs> yeah. The suspect's profile was uploaded to GEDmatch for genetic genealogy, just like in our recent episode 268. There was a hit, but it was a name that had not yet been suggested. The results of the genealogy trace led to a family in the U.S. that had four female and four male children. One of the brothers was very likely the suspect in Sharon's murder. Two of the brothers were deceased and two are still living. One of the deceased brothers had a long criminal history involving sexual assault, among other crimes, and was not in prison at the time of Sharon's murder. He was believed to have been in Quebec, having fled prosecution in the United States for other crimes, when Sharon Pryor died. He himself was 36 years old when he died in 1982, making him 28 at the time of Sharon's death. His family had buried him in West Virginia. The man's living brothers, one in Sarasota, Florida, the other one in Huntington, West Virginia, agreed to DNA tests. Both suggested they were not surprised that their brother had been involved in a murder as he'd been violent all his life. In the first week of December 2022, Rassico and the other investigators on the case received the DNA sample from West Virginia and sent it to the lab in Montreal for matching. The second sample followed soon after. The samples came back as a match. The two living brothers matched with a high probability, 140 million to one, that their deceased brother was Sharon's killer. Rassico was able to let the Pryor family know about the positive results three days before Christmas. Rassico's next steps were to request the exhumation of the suspect's remains from his gravesite in West Virginia for testing, just to be sure they had the right guy. The exhumation finally occurred on May 2nd, 2023 with Rassico and other Longgate investigators and evidence technicians present. Samples were collected from the man's bones and again sent for comparison with the known samples from the crime scene. The man's name was Franklin Maywood Remine. Rassico told the makers of the documentary Don't Rest in Peace, recently released on the streaming service Crave here in Canada, that, quote, Franklin Maywood Remine was an American with a long judicial history. He has many priors, we're talking, at the very least, about 13 criminal convictions. This individual kept crossing the border. Whenever he felt the police were on his heels, he'd go across the border. At this time, we are aware of at least four people who were raped. And at this very moment, we are checking the possibility that he may have committed other crimes of the same nature, both in Canada and the United States. End quote. As the documentary cameras rolled on the 17th of May, 2023, just a week and a half before the recording of this episode, Detective Sergeant Rassico provided the good news to the Pryor family, bringing flowers for Yvonne. They had mixed feelings. The resolution did not bring Sharon back, but it gave them answers that they'd longed for for over 48 years. Yvonne's initial reaction was to exclaim, wow, three times. Then she said, beautiful, and I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy but I'm crying. And then she broke into tears. The family was relieved that it was not someone local and that the man had passed away. He can't hurt anyone else anymore. Recently, Global News covered a press conference involving Eric Rassico and the Pryor family. Here's some audio from the news story that covered that. Five decades of grief finally being released. Yes, it's been an incredible long and difficult journey. A journey that has come to a conclusion as police have finally found the person who killed their big sister, Sharon Pryor, in 1975, thanks to DNA technology. The murderer is now known as Franklin Romine, a man with a long criminal record in the United States and Canada. He was always play playing hide and seek uh, with law enforcement. On Saturday, March 29, 1975, Sharon was on her way to meet friends at a local restaurant, but she never made it. A few days later, her body was discovered in a wooded area in Longueuil, raped and beaten to death. 
Police collected DNA from evidence at the time and throughout the years crossed out 120 possible suspects. Her mother engaged in a dogged pursuit alongside investigators, but Romaine was never on their radar. That's until new DNA technology emerged last year. Labs were able to submit a full DNA analysis to several ancestry websites and matched a family of four brothers in the United States. One of them lived in Montreal at the time of the murder. When we first met them, they told the investigator right away that uh, he's probably uh, the, the, the killer of Sharon Pryor. Romine died in Canada in the 1980s and was buried in West Virginia. Lungoy police worked with American authorities filing a court request to exhume his body. The DNA on the clothing found at the scene was a match. The final piece to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was the murderer. Knowing that her killer is no longer on this earth and cannot kill anymore brings us to somewhat of a closure. The new set of DNA techniques used to solve the murder will now be known as Sharon's Technique. And with it, police say they are on the brink of solving several other cold cases this year, hoping to give closure to more families. We love you, Sharon. Now, may you truly rest in peace. Gloria Enriquez, Global News, Long Bay. After a quick break, we'll be back with an update on the Babes in the Woods case. And we are back. Matthew, uh, thoughts on the Sharon Pryor case. One of the quotes that really stuck out to me was the family was relieved that it was not someone local. Yeah. Um, and it just made me think like, you know, it's a small community, it's a small neighborhood. Uh -huh. All those years of wondering, hey, is it somebody from church? or Is, is it, it the next door neighbor? Is it the neighbor? Is yeah. it somebody that runs the shop? Right. And... To have to live with that for so long is so unfair. Yeah. So unfair um, that that sort of shadow would be cast over the neighborhood for so long. Yeah. Right? Was it one of us? Yeah. But what a relief that it wasn't really. A relief that, that it was an alien kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, but, but at the same time, just all those decades of wondering that yeah. is horrible. Yeah. Uh, in the documentary that I watched... Uh, don't Rest in Peace, it's called. It's on Crave TV right now. Um, the mother uh, talks about, or the mother and sisters talk about having gone to people's homes and watching, you know, these people who they suspected right. to see, it, to get a look at the person. I can't even imagine. Like you're, you're thinking, is this the person that did it? Yeah, I was just watching a movie yesterday where um, one character thinks his daughter was murdered by another one. Okay, yeah. Kills him. Oh, dear. And then literally the next morning, the police say, we, we found the murderers. Yeah. And it wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't anyone. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, he got nominated for a bunch of Oscars. Yeah. But we won't say the name because they've just given away the final ending. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our second update goes all the way back to episode 13 of this show, titled The Babes in the Woods, Stanley Park. On Wednesday, January 14th, 1953, the remains of two young male victims, estimated to have been murdered around 1947, were found in Stanley Park, Vancouver, British Columbia. The investigation revealed a hatchet at the scene, typically used by shingle weavers and lathers, which was identified as the murder weapon responsible for the fatal blows to the boys' heads. The bodies were meticulously positioned in a straight line with the soles of each boy's feet facing the other, and they were shrouded by a woman's rain cape. The course of the investigation was impeded when the coroner initially misidentified one of the victims as female. However, a DNA test carried out in 1998 confirmed that both victims were indeed male and were related as brothers. They were estimated to be between 6 and 10 years old at the time of their tragic slayings. Thanks to genetic genealogy, once again, they've been identified. Often regarded as Vancouver's crown jewel, Stanley Park earned the title of World's Top Park by TripAdvisor's audience in 2014. 
Nestled at Vancouver's northwestern edge, the park promises breathtaking vistas of the Pacific Ocean, Lions Gate Bridge, and north and west Vancouver along its renowned seawall walk. For those seeking tranquility, the park's densely wooded walking trails offer a serene retreat with countless attractions and activities. A visit to Stanley Park is a must if you're traveling to Vancouver. Spanning 405 hectares, Stanley Park is located on traditional Coast Salish territory and according to archaeological findings has been inhabited by indigenous peoples for a minimum of 3,000 years. The first European explorers arrived on the peninsula in the 1790s. Right, and so for people who've never been here, Mm-hmm. And if let's say if you've been to Manhattan, right, and you've seen Central Park, and you even if you haven't, you've seen those aerial photos. You see how large that park is. Yeah, Stanley Park is actually bigger than that. It's about sixty-five hectares larger. Right, it's massive, and and unlike Central Park, it's not manicured. Right, like yeah. it, it's not. It's of, not man-made. Right, it's yeah. it's so much of it is old growth forest. It's it is, preserved. Yeah. It's a forest. Yeah, it's literally a forest with some walking paths through it. Yeah, I love Stanley Park, and it's uh, beautiful. And and the the old Douglas firs, some of them get to 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 about six hundred two hundred and sixty feet tall. Like, right, these are huge trees. There's a big tree that uh, is now burned because of a lightning strike by beaver. The, the yeah yeah, and um, there's a photo of me standing in front of that tree at six years old with my family when we were here from Nova Scotia visiting. And uh, that's the photo that I point to where everybody else looks very Norman Rockwell and I look very Salvador Dali, like a crazy maniac. A little maniac child. Yeah. (laughs) It wasn't burnt in the photo, was it? I don't think it was, no. Due to its strategic location, Stanley Park became a military reserve safeguarding the port of Vancouver through the first Narrows. Even today, the Naval Reserve Division HMCS Discovery is stationed on Dead Man Island. We've talked about that before. In 1886, the city of Vancouver leased the military reserve for park use. Two years later, the park officially opened and was named in honor of Lord Stanley, Canada's sixth Governor General. Lord Stanley also famously donated the original trophy, known as the Stanley Cup, to the National Hockey League. Many consider it to be the most impressive and prestigious trophy in all of sports, a trophy our very own Vancouver Canucks have yet to win, despite coming close in 94 and 2011. On January 14, 1953, Albert Tong, a Vancouver Parks Board employee, stumbled upon a chilling discovery while clearing the brush in the park for fire prevention, halfway between the Lionsgate Bridge and Beaver Lake. His foot struck a hard object beneath the underbrush, which emitted a loud crack. On further inspection, he unearthed the human skull, and to his terror, he found two skeletons beneath a woman's fur coat. Tong delayed reporting his grim find until the following day, and the reason behind this delay remains unclear. Upon receiving the information, Vancouver police officers reached the site and commenced their investigation. Through the meticulous excavation of what seemed like years' worth of debris, They unearthed the remains of two children of varying sizes, suggesting different ages. The smaller skeleton was found face down, adorned with a World War II leather airman's cap. A matching cap was found near the larger skeleton, along with aviator goggles. Decomposing attire and shoes were found on both bodies. You were wondering why he delayed sort of saying that he found a skull. Yeah. I think that we treat skeletons much more differently than we'd treat bodies. Right. So in the 70s, my dad found a skull. Oh, wow. A human skull. Mm -hmm. And I can remember having it for a few days at home and then being in the back of the car, like holding it to take it to an archaeology. Wow. To take it to an archaeology archaeology museum. So whose skull was it? Do you guys find out? The museum said it was hundreds of years old, so it probably would have been a First Nations person. So... Matthew and his dad did the wrong thing. Yeah. You're, you're not supposed to touch it. Yeah. Well, you're supposed I, to call police. I was probably seven or eight, yeah, so right. I don't know that. I, he might have, he, he, we had friends who were police. So, my dad, so he may have, yeah. He, he may have said, hey, and they probably said, oh, you were digging and it was deep, so it's probably really old, so take it to the archaeology museum. And that was the extent of it. Yeah, don't take someone's head home. No. Among the items discovered at the scene were a lunchbox with decayed contents nestled between the bodies, a deteriorating fur coat enveloping the bones, 
and a single size seven and a half women's penny loafer. A striking piece of evidence was an 11 centimeter wide shingler's hatchet with a fractured handle. You're excited about the hatchet. I'm excited about the penny loafers. Why? <laughs> Fun fact. Yeah. Penny loafers were created in the 30s. Yes. When public emergency, like, to make an emergency phone call in a public. An actual penny was put into Two the pennies. Shoe. Yeah. T two pennies were used for phone calls. So they created little pockets for two pennies so you could always make a call. And that's how penny loafers were invented. Well, there you go, Matthew. You, you did not know that, did no, you? No, I learned something new today. All collected evidence was transported to the city morgue. The coroner and pathologist then began the daunting task of piecing together the available information to deduce the circumstances leading to the tragic end of these children. Both had been dead for some time. Estimates were that they had been deceased for five to ten years. Although it was challenging to establish the exact cause of death due to the advanced state of decomposition, it was reasonably deduced that the hatchet was likely the murder weapon. A match was found between the hatchet's blade on the wounds of one of the skulls, while the injuries on the other body corresponded with the hatchet's hammer end. Early hypotheses suggested the smaller skeleton was a girl's and the larger one belonged to a boy between 7 and 10 years old. However, there were no reports of missing children at the time. Police enlisted the assistance of esteemed forensic anthropologist Erna Engel Beiersdorf, a survivor of Auschwitz and Buchenwald concentration camps during the final year of World War II. Shortly after her liberation, she had relocated to Vancouver. Using her expert skills, Beiersdorf crafted molds of the skulls and embarked on a painstaking process of reconstructing the victims' faces with plaster. Ascertaining the exact time of death proved challenging due to the limited scientific tools available at the time and advanced state of decomposition. Even determining the year of the crime was a puzzle to the police. However, analysis of the clothing worn by the children suggested that the crime had taken place post-World War II as the style of shoes the children wore did not become available until around 1947. The woman's shoe and coat size helped sketch a vague image of a stout individual approximately 5 foot 3 inches in height, weighing 125 to 135 pounds. While this information didn't significantly advance the case, it added another piece to the confusing jigsaw puzzle. The police meticulously recreated the boy's attire using Woodward's department store clothing. They dressed a mannequin in the outfit and took photographs hoping that featuring these images in their annual report and newspapers might spark someone's recollection. They wondered if anyone might remember seeing children wearing aviator caps in the park in 1947, although such caps were fairly common then. After the photographs and accompanying story were released in the newspapers across Canada, tips flooded in from coast to coast, but led nowhere. Police were sent on more than one wild goose chase by kooks, liars, and well-meaning busybodies. Interestingly, one of the people who called in a tip about a pair of children missing in New Westminster was the mother of a then seven-year-old Clifford Olson, who after admitting to the murders of 11 local children, would become known as the Beast of BC and one of Canada's most notorious serial killers. Over time, the children's skeletal remains and the gathered evidence were stashed away in the basement of the coroner's court in downtown Vancouver. Eventually, these were showcased in the Vancouver Police Museum. Through the years, many tried to solve the case, but were unsuccessful. In 1996, the intriguing case caught the attention of Detective Sergeant Brian Honeyburn, who had the liberty to examine any cold cases. He chased down some interesting leads that included a woman who checked into the New Haven Hotel with two boys only to vanish, a woman from Mission who hitchhiked to Stanley Park with her two young boys, both sporting aviation helmets, a lady rumored to be a sex worker living with her father and two young boys near the Prospect Point Lighthouse in Stanley Park, and a woman and a man who were spotted with two kids at Stanley Park armed with a hatchet, Witnesses recalled the woman disappearing into the woods with the kids and the man only to return with just the man and blood smeared over her legs. Hollyburn diligently dug into all these narratives, 
Yet he was taken aback to find that the children at the heart of these stories were either still alive or the timelines didn't align with the actual murders. Unfazed and still on the hunt for answers, his diligence led him to gather and bring the remains to the University of British Columbia. The globally recognized forensic dentist, Dr. David Sweet, drew DNA from the teeth in the two skulls using a recently honed technique. A few episodes ago, we were talking about uh, nominative determinism. Yes. Where your last name sort of might determine what you are. Yeah. This is a good one. Dr. Sweet, the dentist. <laughs> Dr. Sweet, yes, because <laughs> you've know, eaten too much sugar, now you need a dentist. Yeah, so he decided to be a dentist because his name was Dr. Of Sweet. Of course he did. DNA tests altered the narrative. The victims were two boys, not a boy and a girl, as previously assumed. Over the years, the police had been following leads about a missing boy and girl, often sidelining tips about two missing boys. Perhaps, had they had the facts initially, the case would have been solved much sooner. Honeyburn had the boys cremated in the late 1990s. In 2008, he took a police boat out into the ocean near Kitts Beach, where he scattered their ashes. In 2014, he spoke with Glenn Schaefer of the province newspaper, and his obsession with identifying the boys remained. His hope was that one day DNA technology would improve to the point that the boys would be given their names back. Honeyburn said, I still think about it. It would be the right thing to do even at this time, to identify those little boys. At least let's do that for them. End quote. Honeyburn's wish finally came true in 2022. In 2021, the last lead investigator on the case, Detective Constable Ada Rodriguez, oversaw using the boys' skulls to obtain DNA once again. The extracted DNA profiles were sent to Redgrave Research Forensic Services, a company specializing in genetic genealogy based in Massachusetts. They uploaded the DNA data to GEDmatch, cross-comparing autosomal DNA data from various testing companies. After 24 days of cross-matching, Redgrave located a potential DNA match on January 31st, 2022. From a Vancouver Sun article, quote, A family member preserved and uploaded their DNA to the genealogy site MyHeritage, hoping that the boys might still be alive. Instead, the family got a call from the police. Quote, One can only imagine what it feels like to have a homicide detective call you and say, we think you might have a relative to a couple of victims in a historical file, said Rodriguez. End quote. The boys were identified as Derek Dalton, born on February 27, 1940, and David Dalton, born on June 24, 1941. Over time, the police successfully identified the maternal grandparents of Derek and David and gradually unveiled more about the boys' lives. Derek and David were raised in British Columbia and attended Henry Hudson Elementary School in Kitsilano. They spent their whole lives in B.C., but the circumstances that led them to Stanley Park at the time of their demise remain a mystery. According to a VPD news release, quote, Vancouver Police Department now believes that Derek and David were descendants of Russian immigrants who came to Canada at the turn of the 20th century. The victims, who lived in Vancouver, had a family member who lived near the entrance to Stanley Park at the time of their death. Investigators theorized the person who killed Derek and David was likely a close relative who died approximately 25 years ago. After seven decades as a cold case, we presume that the person who killed Derek and David had likely passed away, adds Inspector Weidman. But at this stage in the investigation, it was never about seeing someone charged for these crimes. It was always about giving these boys a name and finally telling their story. I'm proud to be part of the team that has done that, end quote. The narrative passed down within the family of Derek and David was that the boys, who were never officially reported missing, had been placed into governmental care. Police continued to investigate the veracity of this account, but Detective Constable Ada Rodriguez deems it improbable. According to an article on VancouverIsAwesome.com, quote, Inspector Dale Weidman, the VPD's major crime section commanding officer, says it's unlikely anyone will be charged with the case as, quote, realistically the suspect is not living anymore. It will remain classified as a cold case, however the police believe the boy's mother was the likely suspect. We make that assumption, says Weidman, so she would definitely be a person of interest if this case occurred today. 
naturally, we would be looking at the mother. Weidman spoke to the Vancouver Sun, quote, This family was very poor. We have to look at this back in 1947, which was a dramatically different landscape from what it is now. We didn't have the social security net that we have now. It was a very sort of rough life, end quote. Although police refused to release the mother's name, true crime writer and friend of the show, Eve Lazarus, wrote that the woman's name was Eileen Busquette and that she'd passed away in 1996. Question. Yeah. Why would the police refuse to um, release her name? Well, it, I don't know. It, it, I think maybe they thought there's kind of no point yeah. in a way because nothing has been proven that she has not... Right. You know, so, yeah. so Eve released the name. Right. This is the mother. She didn't say this is the person who killed the kids. Right. Because at this point, this is still a cold case. Yep. And has not been solved. So you, you don't want to say the mother did it. Unfortunately, it will probably be, always be a cold case at this point in time. A hundred percent it will. Yeah. 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 Um, but pr- the presumption is that... She was responsible. That's the presumption. So did did you did you do these stories because um, of my discussion about not liking these uh, genealogy send your DNA things in? No, <laughs> because I'm like, oh, he's going right for me now. <laughs> of course, <laughs> so, not that you're self centered or anything. <laughs> no, no, I was reading it. And I was just chuckling because we had the debate, right? Yeah. And there's been a lot of like discussion on it in, in the uh, in the Yumber Yard. Yeah, it was just time for updates. Yeah, and no, especially I, I the Sharon that. Pryor one. Uh, you know, it's eight nine days since. Yeah, her family really, found out. Yeah, so yeah. when we're recording this, so it'll be a couple of weeks when you hear it. But uh, but yeah, it's it was like whoa. Yeah. So I had to do it, and I've known about uh, the uh, Babes in the Woods update obviously for over yeah. a year. Yeah, I mean, the Babes in the Woods. It's, it's uh, a very long time ago. Yeah, and p- probably not many people taking solace. But I hope, at least knowing. Uh, at, at least knowing the truth now. Yeah. I hope it helps uh, her family. Um, Cause I, you know, that's just, you know, you look at those photos of her and all, everything she had look, to look forward to. And it's, um, you and, could see a lot of relief in uh, Yvonne Pryor's face. Yeah. And like I said earlier, it was mixed emotion. Like you could see she was relieved, but also sad. Like of course, right? it's a thing that she's been hoping for, for a long time, but not, not a joyous thing. No, because you know? at the same time, it's just... Doesn't bring Sharon back. It doesn't bring her back. And she probably thinks of Sharon every single day. Mm-hmm. But also, it just brings the whole thing back, the whole the whole day back, right? Mm-hmm. And and back to the, the kids from the Babes in the Woods, the Dalton kids. Um, they, their family, didn't know what happened to them. They just thought they had been in care all right. these years and were hoping... Maybe DNA would show up, uh, yeah. you know, their DNA would show up somewhere in some database and like, oh, hey, you're our cousins or yeah. you're our brothers or whatever. So what I find interesting is, so this gene- genealogy stuff with DNA yeah. can literally figure out whose bones they are. Yeah. But they can also find skeletons and family closets that people don't necessarily want. Oh, totally. I was talking to my friend this morning about this when I called her about about the Point neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And she was telling me of a story she had, she had read where there's this like 82-year-old woman who had had a daughter and gave her up for adoption like 64 years prior. Yep. And somehow through this genealogy thing, the daughter figured out who her mother was. Mm-hmm. Mother didn't want her to figure it out she right. didn't want to meet her if she did and she's like okay it was nice meeting her but it was a lifetime ago and while sure this stuff can solve cases at the same time there's so many things that this can bring up well i ha- i have personal experience with that yeah um as i thought one person was my birth father for a while. 51 years, 52 <laughs> a years. A very long while. Yeah. And then discovered through uh, a connection on a 23 and Me yeah. that it was actually the other guy. Yeah. So I was believing that it was one person for years and, yeah. and wondering if I should contact this person. And I'm now I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. Because it's not 
<laughs> it was not him. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, when you found Diane, mm-hmm. right, you both had to write in. Yeah. Right. It had to be two sided. Yeah. And this stuff doesn't allow for that to happen. Well, this is the thing. And right? so now that I know who my birth father is, yeah. I've shaken his hand. Long story. Very long story. You've I've met him. I've met him, yeah. which is bizarre. But we didn't know who each other were at the time. Yeah. And he still doesn't know who I am. Right. He still doesn't know that I have half of his DNA. Yeah. Does not know that. Yeah. And I haven't reached out to him yet because he's got five other boys. You know, he's had a whole other life. And I don't want to just barge in. And that's extraordinarily mature of you. And, uh, and that's something I'd expect from you because I know you, right? Yeah. And you understand, hey, this is a fact, but it's been a long time and he doesn't necessarily, you know. He, he may not even remember Diane. Right. Because, yeah I, yeah, I just didn't, I just suddenly realized that. Like, when you're having some fun, yeah. you might not even know. Right. That has happened. He didn't know. Okay. He had so, no clue that she was pregnant. So, so that, you know, and, and but people who, who have less of maturity than you, Mike, mm. right, can, you know, sometimes, like, all the facts and the truth don't need to be laid out and foisted on people that don't want to know or don't know. I've had people say, well, he'd want to know. Well, and it's it, like, how the hell do you not know? Not necessarily. How do you know that? Absolutely not necessarily, yeah. right? Maybe if you were in his shoes, you would want to know. Yeah. But I'm not going to make an assumption for that person. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine this 84-year-old woman, you know, to be all because, you know, her sister didn't know what to get her niece for Christmas? Yeah. Like, has this foisted on her, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Like, hey, here's a DNA test for Christmas because I didn't know what to get you. And then this poor 84-year-old is like, ugh, having to do this, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 877 dark We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty. Here is our first voicemail. We don't pre-listen, so hopefully it's good. Hey there, pals. I, uh... I called a couple of weeks ago. I just, I'm calling again because I really do want to implore you to research the homicide of Deborah York. Um, I'm calling from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. I used to have a physical relationship with uh, the person who committed the homicide uh, before he was all messed up. And uh, anyway, I'm I'm interested in it. I'd like to see what you guys kind of think about it. But Deborah York, her life was was shamelessly taken by someone who didn't deserve even her time of day. So I'd love to hear what you guys think. And uh, again, I'm calling from Halifax. If you guys want to get in touch with me, I would, uh, if I hear it on your show, <laughs> I'll reach out to you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I used to hang out with Buddy. He's a lot younger than uh, Deborah was. I am currently just about to turn 27. So uh, he's, I think, a couple years older than me. So um, he's just a young fella, but he's still in jail for it. And, you know, as well he should. But it was a, it was a clutch to, to be, you know, anyway, he was closer to me than I would have wanted him to be. <laughs> so anyway, I would love to uh, hear your take on the case. And uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch, I'd love to, I'd love to chat. So uh, it's Emily signing off. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for calling, Emily. Thanks, uh, Emily. I don't think we've ever had the ex-girlfriend of a murderer call in before. Did you say girlfriend? Physical relationship. Oh, I thought she said fiscal relationship. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And I'm like, what's a fiscal relationship? Help. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. I was sitting here thinking, Emily's an accountant. <laughs> I don't know a lot of Nova Scotians who would actually use that word. Well, I've never thought of it I, before. We would say I was in business with. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm like, what's a fiscal relationship? It was physical. <laughs> and thanks for your call, Emily. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to look into that case a little more and I may reach out to you, Emily, if you're uh, open to chatting some more about it. Cause that's yeah, really, dude. really fascinating. Um, yeah. Wow. Whoa. I don't even know what to say about that. Um, yeah, <laughs> let's, let's move on to our next voicemail. Yeah. That one was, uh, Hey, Mike and Matthew calling from Nova Scotia. And, um, just wondering if you are considering doing uh, coverage of the Kenley Matheson disappearance that happened from Acadia University in the 90s. Um, still unsolved, but really intriguing case. And uh, yeah, I called before and mentioned it. And I uh, haven't seen it yet, so I'm just wondering if you're considering it. Hope you do. Hope you're having a great day. And go take a shit in your hats, boys. All right. So another Nova Scotian. My, my peeps are chiming well, in. Well, Nova Scotia wants, uh, want, wants the stories told, Mike. But uh, the Kenley Matheson case, I am very well aware of, as well as the documentary. I'm probably going to reach out to the people uh, who are still hoping that that is solved, i.e. his family and friends, uh, with the hope of uh, gathering them to come on to an episode. Because I think it's important, too, um, I went to basketball camp for two summers at Acadia University, and my dad grew up in Wolfville, so I, I am well familiar with that town. And the fact that somebody was has gone missing and potentially, who knows what happened to to Kenley? Right. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. What town is that? Wolfville. Wolfville. Yes. Yeah. Known for wolves, is it? No, it's not no. known for wolves. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I am looking at doing that case at some point, probably soon. Let's listen to another voicemail. We've got uh, four this week, and here's Hi, another from three. Nova Scotia. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Hey, Mike. Hey, Matt. I'm, uh, I'm a FedEx driver out in uh, Peterborough, Ontario here. Um, I listen to you guys pretty much every day now for about just over a month. I listen to you guys over eight hours a day um, while I'm out and about making my deliveries. And you guys are just so cool. Like um, you, you really have a way with your words and you really keep me intrigued. Um, you know, even when I'm out and about and I'm getting really tired and I'm just like, kind of done with the day i just i i tune into you guys and I, I i turn the radio up and you guys just kind of really help me get uh get through those days and um yeah you just have a really good way with your storytelling and uh and matt like you you're when you chime in like it just it ties it all together and your guys's perspectives and and that you put into it and how much um, respect and appreciation you have towards these stories is, is really evident um, in, in your stories. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to call and, and say thank you. Um, thank you for, for giving me so much um, joy. Um, and I know like it's typically like darker sides of things that you guys talk about, but it's, it's so interesting and so intriguing to me. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to say thank you. And I wanted to say uh, that I really just appreciate you guys and your perspective on things and how respectful you guys are towards the, the victims of the stories. And even the comedic chimes, like just kind of alleviate a lot of that darkness. Um, but yeah. Go take a shit in your hat, and uh, thank you so much. Well, Bye thanks. Bye. That That's great. I, I'm really glad that we can help a FedEx driver, you know, manage their day. Get through that day. Because I, I can't imagine, you know, you're... I mean, I, it would keep you on your toes having to drive to different addresses all the time. I, I kind of thought it would be interesting to, to, to drive. Because there's like, there's... I don't know. Is I wonder if there's like a freedom to it as well. You're not in an office. Sure. Oh, you know for sure. I mean? there and you're, you're out and about and seeing But then the you're world. also at the whim of the other creatures who are on the road. Right. And the, and the people yelling at you if they yeah. didn't get their delivery or something. Like yeah, exactly. Well, I had a FedEx delivery just this week. I'm pretty sure it wasn't 
this caller, but no, you're not in Peterborough, no, <laughs> Ontario, no. Um, yeah, and in terms of like the the humor, mm-hmm. it kind of comes natural to naturally to me. My family, actually, the way we show love mm-hmm. is even in like dark times, as we tell, we we joke about things with each other. Sure, so, my family does that too. Yeah, so it's um, I'm I'm glad it's uh, I'm glad people appreciate it. And I'm always always freaked out when people like us. You are? Yeah. How come? Because it's just us. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's just us. You, you know what I mean? It's just us, right? That's we true. just like do the show and, and have a good time and try to tell good stories. And people like it, which is fantastic. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to one last voicemail. This looks like a short one. So hopefully they don't tell us to go, you know, really go shit in our hat. Hey, I'm going to try this again. This is my last one. I kind of choked a bit. <laughs> um, so my name is Bailey. Uh, I live in Edmonton, Alberta. I've been listening to y'all for about a year now. Uh, I download about 10, 9 to 10 episodes a day to get me through my stressful days and this one into being a douche canoe. Um, I just want to thank y'all for what you do, bringing light to all these dark stories and bringing everyone laughs. Uh, keep on keeping on and go shit in your head. There you go. Bailey from Edmonton. Thank you, Bailey. What does Bailey do there in Edmonton, Matthew? What does Bailey do? Yes. She drives an ice cream van in the summertime. An ice cream van. Yeah. Did you ever uh, drive an ice cream van? No, I almost got hit by one once. I used to drive the ice cream bike. That was my first job, the Dickie D ice cream bike. Dickie D. Yes. In 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 London, it was the famous one was Mr. Whippy. Mr. Whippy. <laughs> that so, sounds like something that I did in the toilet. But, but Mr. Ba- Whippy. But Bailey drives ones ice cream for adults. Oh, so it was boozy ice cream? Yeah, like Bailey's. Oh, you know? okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, boozy yeah. ice cream. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, ice cream that I can't eat. No, yeah, <laughs> but they have penis-shaped ones that you could eat that don't have alcohol in them. They have what? Penis-shaped ones, lollipop. Um, I thought that's what you said. That you can eat that there's no booze in them. Mm. Yeah, I think, I don't know if I want one of those. Suck a dick. <laughs> <sighs> I guess that's it for voicemails. <laughs> that's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Alrighty, it is time for Patreon and Donut Money Donors. Dun, da, da, da. And it looks like we have a couple of patrons this week. Nice. Um, First up, we have Marilyn Kingsley. Marilyn Kingsley. And I don't know where Marilyn Kingsley is from, Matthew. Kingston. Kingston, Ontario? It's She's the Kingleys of Kingston. Kingsleys of Kingston. Well, there yeah. you go. And what does Marilyn do in Kingston, Ontario? So this is a weird one. Oh, they always are. She's a marshmallow sculptor. So she sculpts in marshmallow. Intricate sculptures using marshmallows. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. That's kind of cool, actually. And they eventually melt. So it's like, what, what do the Buddhists do? They create those, what are those called? They create, Mandala. Ma- they, they're kind of like Mandalas because she knows they're going just to sort of dissolve. Dis- dissolve eventually. or disappear with the wind. So it's almost performance art, right? That's very nice. Yeah. I like that. My buddy Art, who listens to the show, your buddy Art. Art. Hi, um, Art. Does he, does he listen regularly? Yeah, he listens. Um, he does um, art, uh, art for art's sake, he art calls it. Art for art's sake. But he creates little uh, stuff on the beach. Uh, at, nice. At, uh, a below the high tide line. Yep. So the tide, when the tide comes in, it washes nice. away his little art piece. Hey, Art, Mike and I would like to come over for dinner again sometime. Yeah, right. I'm good Rem- for... <laughs> remember that meat he cooked? It was so good. Yes. Art's a good cook. I'm going to see if he actually listens to your show and and we'll know if we get it. Well, I'm seeing him on Monday. We're going well, don't for a tell walk. Him. Don't tell him. Well, he won't see, He won't hear it until two weeks from That's now. That's fine. So. I'll, I'll be free in a couple of weeks. There you go. <laughs> Next we have, oh, this is a fun name, Amber Cadabra. <laughs> Amber Cadabra. And she's from Verdun, Quebec. Oh. Yeah. I know where Verdun is. Okay. 
That's quite close to the story that we're telling. If it's, if it's like, uh, it's the Verdun neighborhood of uh, Montreal. Yeah, there you go, Verdun. Yeah. And uh, what does Amber Cadabra do for? I I would hazard to guess she's either a witch or a magician. She's a magician. Oh, there you go. Yes. Yeah. What's her favorite trick? Her favorite trick? Yeah. She's got to have a favorite trick as a magician. They're not tricks, Mike. Okay. Her favorite illusion. It's not an illusion. It's real magic. Okay. So what's her favorite real magic event? Making people disappear. <laughs> I'm sure that, that little exchange we just had might have made some people disappear too. The problem is... Yep. Um, she's kind of in trouble because she can't get them back. Oh. <laughs> so every time she does a show, somebody goes missing. Oh, dear. Yeah. 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 So so, so, people, so she can make them disappear, just not reappear. Yeah, so she's having a hard time getting um, people to volunteer for, for the show now, well, out of the audience. Well, this makes sense to me, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not so sure I would want that. <laughs> To be maybe, made to disappear. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe they end up in Hawaii or somewhere nice. They could. Yeah. But I, I don't want to take that chance. Just, <laughs> it could just, be somewhere bad. Yeah. It's like, oh, you, you wake up at the bottom of a well. Yeah, wake up at the bottom of the well or in... In a cave. Scarborough or something. Scar <laughs> Scarborough? <laughs> Nothing wrong with Scar... Well... Scarberia. Scarberia. No, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners in Scarberia. There are. There are some. I wonder if one of them have that $70 million lottery ticket that's about to run out of time that was bought in Scarborough. Oh my goodness. Can like you imagine? A couple days from uh, from a year, 70 million bucks. Somebody has a ticket sitting in a drawer somewhere or in their wallet and it... That's clock, why I do the app because you can't lose it. out. <laughs> you can't lose it. So when I saw that, I actually quickly went on my diary to see if by chance I was like in a business meeting in Scarborough that week. Yeah. And... I wasn't. Oh, well. Just in case I'd like, hey, I'll buy a ticket. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> I actually checked if I bought a ticket in Scarborough, the other side of the country. Yeah. Well, we don't have any donut money donors this week. Well, we sold some t-shirts. So, t-shirts. T-shirts. Made 13 bucks sh selling t-shirts. Yeah. It's not a big amount that we make from t-shirts. It is really not. Because you got to make the shirt first. Well, yeah. yeah. But, but still, you know. If a thousand people bought a t-shirt, we'd be, we'd have some money, but. I like the new, I like the go shit in your hat t-shirts. The rainbow one With that I'm wearing right now? It. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun. So you can get that at our Dark Poutine store. If you go to darkpoutine.com slash store, you can see the shirts. Darkpoutine.com slash store. Anyway, uh, that's it. T-shirts and more. <laughs> Marketing. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that's it for this episode. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Goodbye.